we got to get one. And uh, I think Steve Rombaum, you could probably count on a couple of fingers all the Hope speakers who have spoken at every single Hope since 1994. Um, 20 years we go back with Steve Rombaum. He's a, not only a legend in his own mind, he's a legend to all of us. Um, and it's, it's always guaranteed to be, guaranteed to be a jaw-dropping session of uh, all the info, all the docs on you that are dropped by corporations. This is just private, this is private sector stuff. Government stuff would uh, really blow you away. But in any case, Steve's going to give you a little less than three hours of jaw-dropping uh, entertainment and fear-mongering. <laughs> Tin foil hat wearing. Um, it's incredibly detailed. I saw some of the slides earlier. So uh, I don't really have to give any more introductions, introductions to Steve Rob. Oh, by the way, uh, you want to mention uh, during your talk the uh, world premiere of your uh, TV series that just came out? So he'll mention that. It was, it was next door a few, few hours ago. Give us a great presentation. Thanks. Steve Rombaum. Okay, so if I was going to have to do this like a... You know, I, I'm telling you, this is... I, I'm cursed. I'm cursed. It, it, really, it really is. Okay, what do I need to do here? Now I need like... I think I've broken. <laughs> okay. By the end of the day, every bit of hardware will be damaged. All right. Yes, my name is Steve Rombaum, and uh, this was going to be an extremely rapid talk because for the first time in a couple of hopes, I wanted to actually leave enough time for Q&A. Uh, now I'm going to have to do this like, like a speed freak. I've been giving this talk for uh, 18 years. Uh, 20 years ago, I was on a panel that covered this topic. Uh, 18 years ago, I started with the Privacy is Dead talks. This is my eighth or ninth Privacy is Dead talk. And privacy is now beyond dead. It's uh, a little sad to me that it took an Edward Snowden to make everyone realize that every bit of their life, uh, their digital life, their details of their friends, their family, their likes, their dislikes, where they go, what they do, what books they read, who they associate with, what their politics are, has drip by drip by drip been gathered into databases. Uh, I've been speaking about this for some time, but I think Edward Snowden has managed to provide much more graphic examples than I have. I used to point out that with any one piece of information, it's now possible to expand that one piece of information, whether it's a license plate, a telephone number. Today, just taking a picture of your face is enough. And it can be expanded to your name, your address, your phone, your date of birth, your social security number. There is no person in this room, from the United, United States person in this room, who I can't gather this information on them within less than 90 seconds. And if you don't believe me, come to me after the talk and I'll show you. I really will. Not just the basic information, how they vote, what religion they follow, what their politics are, but their medical history, what books they read, what music they listen to, what they do for a living, their skills, their salary, their employment, lawsuits, criminal prosecution, everything you've purchased, everywhere you've gone, and more than that, thanks to something called predictive profiling, where you're going to be next week and what you're probably going to be doing. The reason for this is self-contributed data. It's not the NSA gathering up your metadata, which, by the way, in the great scheme of things, is a joke compared to what's out there on you. This is not because the CIA or Big Brother. This is because everything that you do, you talk about, you tweet about, you post, you Facebook, every iota of your life you put out there, now, I have to tell you, 
as a fellow citizen, it creeps me out. I'm a little older than most of the people in this room, except for the senior citizens in the front row. But, uh, but uh, well, you're here because your eyesight is bad and you want to see the screen. <laughs> but except, for the most part, I'm a generation older than, than most of the people in this room. When I was, and uh, you know, I feel like I should say something like, uh, you know, when I was hacking, I had to walk five miles in the snow with, a, with an acoustic coupler to find a payphone. Um, the, the, the truth is, when I was your age, you didn't share this sort of stuff. There was an expression when I was a kid, damn, I wouldn't have told that. Now there's, there's nothing that fits within that description. People talk about their sexual activities and their drug use and the crimes. I can tell you when I do an investigation, a criminal investigation, the first thing I do is I go to Facebook. You would be amazed how many people pose with the proceeds of their crimes or put up videos of rapes they've committed. Every, it's not funny if you're the rape victim, so don't laugh. Um, people share everything. I don't get it. As an investigator, thank you very much. But, but as, a, as a fellow citizen, as a friend, as a, as a colleague, it creeps me out. Uh, uh, Deviant, by the way, that's one of the great benefits of speaking at Hope. You hear from guys named Deviant. Deviant sent me a great example. Last week, there was an article in Wired magazine talking about new interfaces to the IMAP email system. I mean, the most boring article you've ever read in your life. But apparently some people got very excised over it and had a troll fight. And one guy did what you should never, there's two things you should never say on the internet, Nazi or Luddite. And, and uh, they called this, 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 poor, this poor schmuck who, who unfortunately for him had the name, you don't know me, called somebody a Luddite. Well, apparently he did know him. Your name is so-and-so and you live in Portland, Oregon. You're pretty shit at triathlons, and last year you humili humiliated yourself by coming in whatever out of 183. I'm sure your mom, so-and-so, wouldn't be proud to talk about it in her weekly gossip circles. She prefers to think about the days when she lived in Glendale or Pasadena. Instead of wasting time on a short-sighted son, at least you managed to trick so-and-so into marrying you, huh? By, by the way, uh, she should update her blog, such and such a URL. And it goes on like that for pages, for pages. And, and, and he ends, and he ends, so the next time somebody talks about the importance of privacy, you should probably listen, imagine what people can find on you, blah, 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 and then one last zing, you know, his stupid cowboy costume. Listen, this is a guy with no special skills. He got insulted, it was a troll versus troll fight, and that's it. His whole life was on the internet. It's really this easy. And if it's this easy for a guy in the middle of the night commenting on a Wired article, imagine what I can get on you. People don't care. People put everything on the internet. I, you know what, by the way, the guy over here, for those of you who are lawyers, this is a drunken lawyer in a rabbit suit. Um, which, which to me, anything that gives me the opportunity to say, to say drunken lawyer in a rabbit suit, great. People share everything. I just made love. This is a thing. This is an app. And by the way, here's the locations. And by, I have to tell you, if you zoom in, half of these locations are parking lots. Seriously, try, try, try it out. Okay, I saved the sickest one for last. PMS buddy. This is a thing. You know, you want to warn your friends don't talk to me for the next five to seven days. And, 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 but, but here's the sickest thing. Is, I don't know, is my pointer working? Okay, well, I need one of those like green helicopter knocking ones, but okay, if you look over there, PMS buddy, now on Facebook. The little, the little seal there. Great, so people look in, you know, they, they, they look at your Facebook page, they want to send you a note, oh, I better wait a few days. Okay. Now, I hope I made my point. Hey, thank you, brother. Okay, Jesus, this is like an, this is gonna like, this is gonna like burn a hole through the screen. Okay, thank you. I'm actually gonna use this thing. Okay, 
Now to be serious, why should you give a shit? Okay? This is no longer a, 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 a G-rated uh, DVD. Why should you give a shit? Here's why you should give a shit. Because you never can tell what's waiting around the corner in your life. Uh, and I say that as a guy who is probably the only one in this room to have been removed from a HOPE conference in handcuffs. Look, in the 1930s, people who were left-wing, communist, anti-Hitler people were the good guys. In the 1950s, the same people were put in jail for what they did in the 1930s. There's a book I recommend that you read called Three Felonies a Day. I rarely give shout-outs to books, but it's a, an amazing book. It talks about how everybody in this country inadvertently commits three prosecutable crimes a day. It's really true. You can't, you, you, maybe not three, but one a week is enough. I can tell you that if I, as an investigator, target you, I will find something you can be arrested for within a couple of weeks of looking. Changed attitudes about dissent. When I was growing up, people understood that you're allowed to make a mistake. You get a reboot in your life. If you're a teenager, it's your job to screw up. It's your job to do something stupid. There's no sense of humor anymore. I can tell you that the U.S. Department of Justice is not about prosecuting bad guys, arresting bad guys anymore. And it pains me to say this as their colleague. It's about winning and losing. Once you are brought to the Department of Justice and arrested, it's all about making you plead guilty. 98.5% of all people arrested and prosecuted by the federal justice system in this country plead guilty. 98.5%. I can promise you 98.5% are not, in fact, guilty. The minute you go into, there's a saying in federal law enforcement, you can beat the charge, maybe. You can beat the charge. You can't beat the ride. And what they do to you is, from the very first moment, they begin to destroy you. They confiscate all your money as proceeds of a criminal enterprise. So you can't afford an attorney. You can't afford an expert. You can't afford me. You can't afford bail. You sit in jail. You can't assist with your defense. As far as assisting with your defense, they don't give you the evidence until a nanosecond before the trial. Um, and they give you an offer that is so widely disparate on how much time you might spend in jail. If you plead guilty, you get 18 months, you get your money back. If you don't plead guilty, in the case of Aaron Schwartz, Schwartz, 35 years. Plead to something, maybe you get probation or go to jail. Let me tell you, it is bullying of the worst order. And I want to tell you what was done to Aaron Swartz, and he and I had a lot of mutual friends, uh, one of whom I'm sure is in this room. I haven't seen her today, but uh, she knows who she is. Um, what they did to Aaron Schwartz was, was drive him to suicide. They did the equivalent of, of kicking a little harmless puppy because he was barking too loud. What did this kid do? He, <laughs> he went into a broom closet with a bicycle helmet over, over his face. That's the best he could do to be a master criminal. And, they, and he was facing 35 years in jail because he had the temerity to hire an attorney and spend the money that he made and fight. If you fight, they don't care if you're innocent at that point. They have to crush you. They have to make an example out of you. And, and as I always am willing to point out, I'm a right-wing guy. I'm a very right-wing guy. I'm a very pro-law enforcement guy. Um, I work with federal law enforcement all the time, not the FBI, but, uh, but uh, with pretty much every other agency. And most of them are great guys, most of them. Uh, I don't agree with, with, a, with a lot of what uh, Mr. Snowden said earlier today, but he's right about one thing. The culture in this country has changed for the worse. He's absolutely right about that. And uh, assuming that you're a good guy 
and you're a good girl, and you're doing things for the right reasons, and you think you haven't committed a crime, it's not good enough anymore. You cannot allow yourself to be put in a position where you can be made a victim for no good reason. You have the Obama White House asking for details of people who opposed its policies. You have Operation Choke Point, which I'm going to tell you about in a second. Next slide. Most of all, most of all, storage is damn near free now. And I can tell you that every governmental agency saves everything. And every governmental agency hoovers up everything. I do it as an investigator. Uh, once you put a piece of information out there, it's not yours, you don't own it anymore, and you can't get it back. You can't. You can't change your mind. You can't say, you know what, I changed my mind. I want privacy. I want anonymity. And we're going to be talking about how difficult it is to be anonymous and to be an anonymous whistleblower. It's a real job. 1939, this was a Stop Hitler rally. This photo was taken by the NYPD Red Squad. This photo was used to go after the people in the rally 15 years later. What you do today might bite you in the ass 15 years from now. Operation Choke Point is the best example I could come up with. Do me a favor. Here's your, here's your homework assignment for tonight from Professor Steve. After this talk, go and learn everything you can about Operation Choke Point. This is not black helicopter stuff. This is from the Washington Post. Um, the Obama administration has been pressuring banks to shut down financial services for absolutely legal industries that it disagrees with, to cut off the oxygen to these industries, hence Operation Choke Point. The ability to destroy legal industries through secret actions to deprive them of banking services has obvious political consequences. You think? Here's some examples. Ammo sales, coin dealers, dating services, escort services. All right, look, escort services are, isn't the most savory service, but it's legal. And they are shutting off services to legal industries that they disagree with. Huh? Whatever. Um, lottery sales, pharmaceutical sales, pornography. Listen, racist material. Would I like to see racist material disappear? Sure. Uh, not as much as I'd like to see freedom of speech remain intact. You don't like what somebody says? Ignore him, put your foot in his ass, but you don't ban him. This is the current state of things in America. And by the way, it can be as simple as somebody going, oops except the federal government never says oops. They never say I'm sorry. Of the 300 complaints, the last 300 complaints filed against FBI agents with the OPR, their internal affairs unit, not one was upheld. Not one was upheld. According to the Department of Justice, FBI agents don't make mistakes. That's a real, that's a real thing. FBI checks wrong, block, wrong box, places student on no-fly list. Now, by the way, if you know about this case, it took seven years of litigation for this poor girl to find out about this. And the witnesses that she was going to bring in for the trial were put on no-fly list the week before so they couldn't come in. Yeah, it's funny, you know, witness in a no-fly fly trial, put on a no-fly list. It's not so funny. It's not so funny. This is a new country. This is a new way of doing things. Dissent, inconvenience in governmental agencies is not tolerated anymore. And you need to start thinking about your information and your lives differently. This is not a happy talk we're going to be having today. So you want to be an informant. To be an informant, you have to A, have information. B, deliver the information. And by the way, I'm going to stop saying informant, I'm going to start saying whistleblower. In my world, it's informant. In your world, it's whistleblower. So how easy is it to figure out who a whistleblower is? Ridiculously easy. Ridiculously. Who has access to the information? That takes it down from 300 million people to 
20. When was the information delivered? How do you deliver the information? How do you get the information and deliver it to the person you want to blow the whistle to? The Washington Post reporter, the WikiLeaks Dropbox, whoever. How do you do that? Follow-up questions. What happens if the reporter needs to get in touch with you? Hey, this is fascinating, but here's 87 things I don't understand. One reason why Snowden, who again, I'm not a fan of, was so successful is he's interactive with the reporters. He sat down with them, he answered all the questions. You can reach him on the phone. You can, you can uh, video chat with him. Choke points. Choke points are where privacy invasion and government stifling of dissent meet. Choke points mean for me to get this secret information from point A to person B, I had to do one of a number of things. I had to call them, I had to email them, I had to go visit with them, I had to send them a letter. These are choke points. You can work backwards if you're a good governmental investigator. Now I know what I'm talking about, I've done dozens of industrial espionage cases which are essentially the same thing. Here are your problems. Cameras, drones, facial recognition, info capture, Cellular phones are the, big, are, the big are the big paradigm changer. Massive databases, nothing being thrown away. Profiling of persons, and the last is the most important. We're actually gonna probably cut out about 100 of the slides so I can make sure that I'm talking to you about de-anonymization. You think that if you use Tor, and if you use a public Wi-Fi to connect to the Tor, and you use a clean laptop, that you've scrubbed and you're only using for your whistleblowing, you can't be identified. Nothing could be further from the truth. There's now device fingerprinting. There's now forensic linguistics, which lets me identify who wrote something just by massive comparison of other posts to the net. There are dozens of ways that you can be de-anonymized. One critical point I'd like to make before we really start rolling. When I used to give this talk, I used to say, you know what, we're only gonna talk about private databases, stuff that I have access to and other PIs have access to and a, and a skilled hacker has access to. We're not gonna talk about any of the governmental databases. Let me tell you why that's not a valid thing to say anymore, because there's no difference. The US government today outsources its privacy invasion. Axiom, InfoUSA, all the three credit bureaus, Google, Facebook, especially Microsoft, including Skype, all provide information to the US government, all. There is no difference. If you put something on Facebook, it's the same as you CCing it to the NSA. There is no difference. And one thing, one thing that Snowden talked about which was important, anybody who doesn't share or who doesn't share quickly enough with the government, government says, no problem. They tap a cable, they write a script, and they suck it up. I can tell you that I have a computer in my office doing nothing, 24-7, 365, but grabbing Facebook pages, nothing. I have millions and millions and millions and probably tens of millions of photos in my office. And I'm gonna show you some stuff. Um, I guarantee you that the, the US government has every single Facebook page, every single one with every single entry. And it's already been reported they tapped the cables right into, right into Facebook, the, 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 uh, the data pipes right into Facebook and right into Google. Anything that you put up on the internet there's no segregation anymore. There's no private information, public information. There was a case, USA versus Jones, where the Supreme Court quite correctly said, if you put a GPS device on a car, you've gotta have a warrant. Can't do that anymore. FBI said, no problem. They just started going to the phone companies and getting the GPS devices off the phones, which is 100 times better. It's with you all the time. If you leave a car, you leave the GPS on the car. Nobody leaves their phone. 
64% of people in America sleep next to their cell phone. 64% of the, those same 64% of people check their cell phone the first thing they do when they wake up. Maybe they scratch themselves, and then they check their cell phone. Nobody makes a secret about it. Here is Fed, hold on, let me use the really good pointer. Fed biz ops gov. These are business opportunities. Things that, these are RPFs, requests for purchases. Things that the United States government wants. This, this one, I mean, they announce what they're doing. They want to grab YouTube clips and video everywhere on the web and have interpretation of that, which I can tell you smart, smart cameras can already do. People are fighting, people are driving, people are at a demonstration, people are doing it, giving an interview. You can now run a clip through analysis and actually run millions of clips through analysis and it will say, this is a clip with Bob Jones and he's at a demonstration. Not a problem. All of the major companies have special governmental units for selling stuff to the governments. Here's, by the way, Google Government Services. Now, the funny thing is, by the way, there's an outfit called, uh, called uh, Pando. And when they put that up, Google immediately took down all the things they're doing for the government and just put up a generic page. They're still doing the same stuff. Facebook, let me tell you, Facebook is profiling and analyzing its members now in a way you can't even imagine, beyond what Big Brother dreamed. It's determining from postings and from content and from phrases your politics, your friends, your family, your associates, whether you're an activist or not, what you believe in, what you do. They've, here's keywords, parents to their adult children. These are keywords that, that they've determined indicate a parent to adult children relationship. Here's a parent to younger child. By the way, I, I, had, to, I had to emphasize that. One of the things is, is eye out. Like if you keep running with that, you're gonna take your eye out. That's, I can, I can testify that that is something a parent says to a small child. And why are, the, why, why are these, these Companies, why is Google and Facebook and Microsoft and whatever doing this? One reason and one reason alone. They don't care about you. They don't want to know about you. Believe me, Zuckerberg is off, you know, slaughtering a chicken or whatever he's doing. He doesn't care. He wants to make money off of you. That's it. And, and the biggest possible customer is the U.S. government. And the U.S. government is right now not just gathering information, they're determining how to use it to influence people and to direct events, how to make a mob that's going left go right, how to make people support policies. It is the most insidious evil thing imaginable. And Facebook wants to get U.S. government contracts. So recently, they ran a test. If we put certain postings, if we take in the name of your friend, and we send you a certain type of posting, will that make you do X? Will it make you do Y? And they tried it a million times. This, this news just came out very, very recently. Why is Facebook doing this? Because they want to make you happy? Because they want to make you sad? No, they want to give customers, with a reason to use this, the ability to influence people's emotions and actions. Facebook has a cell phone now. A cell phone is the biggest privacy invader there is. Facebook has a cell phone that can turn on the microphone, can listen to words, can determine what you're doing, what music you're playing, what TV, they say it's what music you're listening to, what TV show you're watching, so on and so forth. I, I don't care what the reason is. I really don't. This is outrageous. Facebook is profiling people in new ways. This is all new stuff. They are matching people. They are developing marketing that is the most finely targeted marketing imaginable. If I want a tap dancing Chinese grandmother in Milwaukee, they can give me 20 of them. It's amazing. 
lookalike audiences. Facebook involves friending people and associating with people. Unless you are a remarkably open-minded person, which 99% of the world is not, uh, you associate with people who are like you, who think like you, who like the things you like, who, who believe what you believe. If I don't know anything about you and I see your 10 closest friends, I know everything about you. And that's a fact. You can send Facebook a list of numbers. They will tell you everything about the person at that number. Metadata? Metadata is child's play compared to what Facebook does. And I have to say, before we continue, I've always said one thing during these talks. I am not going to express a personal or a political opinion. I'm not going to tell you what I think you should think. I am going to tell you what I think you should think about. I'm going to modify that a little bit because, because things are serious today. And I want to say this. If you're horrified by NSA gathering your metadata, you should be insane. You should be marching with pitchforks and torches about what Google and Facebook is doing. Because number one, let's face it, they have less right and less need for it. I mean, the U.S. government, no matter what you say, is doing some good stuff, like fighting heroin importation, fighting Al-Qaeda. I mean, there must be something that the U.S. government does that makes you, that you will acknowledge, makes you safer, makes this a better, freer place. I mean, we can have this type of discussion. Trust me, if we wanted to go and meet with Mr. Snowden and have this conversation in Russia, not going to happen. Not going to happen. America is a unique, pretty wonderful place in my opinion. A lot of room for improvement lately, but a pretty damn good country. And the U.S. government is using this information for that. I'm not being a shill for them. I'm just putting it out there. And I'm putting it out there to compare it. What the hell is Facebook doing with this? They're selling you T-shirts with cats' pictures on them. I mean, would you rather f give out your, your personal information to be safe or to buy a T-shirt? It's a ridiculous example, but if you're upset about the U.S. government doing this, honestly, the one opinion I'll express today, you should be insane about Facebook and Google doing it. Amazon, Amazon is the new repository for CIA data files. And at the same time, there's an Amazon phone, and if you look at what Amazon Fire TV does, it has a microphone. It listens. You cannot turn the microphone off. It sends your commands and your speech to the Amazon servers. Can't do anything about it. Nothing. And by the way, there's no off switch. There's no off switch. They learn something from the iPhone. You can't power it off that easily. Now I'm going to start speeding up. I just want to say that I give a two-day seminar on this general topic, which is called computer-aided investigation. What, what investigators and law enforcement and special agents need to know to use these tools. I'm giving you guys the Reader's Digest version of this and I still can't fit in more than about 10%. And by the way, there's some stuff I wouldn't mention also, but never mind. Again, these are the key, these are the key issues today. Cell phones, indexing, indexing videos, inde speech to text, cameras, efforts to create target marketing, but especially, but especially your data is worth money. Google and Facebook and Microsoft and everybody else out there will do whatever they can to get you to tweet and check in and blog and post and contribute as much of your life and as many of your photos and every other bit of data as you, as you can. They will push you and urge you and tell you, hey, your friends posted five more photos. Why don't you tag these photos for us? It's worth money. It's always about money. Always. 
And there is no forgetting, nothing, no data ever goes away. This is a slide I've put up every time I've spoken for the past eight years. This is a guy who tweets every minute of his life. And you know what? It's not that unique. I look at some people that tweet 50 or 100 times a day. 50, I mean, there are people with 20,000 tweets. How, how is that possible? I mean, first of all, their thumbs, sh never mind. Facebook. One out of every five minutes you spend online, you spend on Facebook. One in two minutes on social sites on Facebook. People on Facebook are terrorized into using their real names, their ages, their email addresses, and to contribute and to contribute, and it's never thrown away, never. And Facebook is colonizing the web. That's their term, not mine. Every time you click on a like button, every time you use your Facebook login to log in to make a comment or to log into another site, you contribute to the massive store of data that Facebook has, open graph. And Facebook has absolute contempt for you. Every time you push Facebook back a little bit, every time they, they, they take one step back in terms of privacy, believe me, while you're not looking, they do two steps forward. And it's not just actual subscribers. They are building shadow profiles of everyone who's not on Facebook, everyone who you reference in your posts, everyone through marketing databases they connect to you, or buying up the entire TransUnion Credit Bureau file they can connect to you. They know even if your mom and your dad and your sister and your brother and your wife or your husband or whatever aren't on Facebook, they know who that person is. Everything. And by the way, your friends rat you out. This is a Facebook warning, which I guarantee you maybe 1% of even this room has seen. This is all the information that your friends contribute on you. If you don't put it out there, other people do. Facebook bought face.com. Probably at that time the best facial recognition program in the world, and they've made it even better. And let me tell you why. And now I get to really use this green thing. I don't know, can you see this little tiny, little tiny dark thing there? That's all the photos held by the U.S. Library of Congress. Okay, next one, Instagram. These are Instagram photos. Next, Flickr, and this is Facebook. There are, and this is an actual so help me goodness statistic, one billion photos uploaded to Facebook every week. One billion, I know I should do the little pinky, th pinky thing, one billion photos, but it's, not, but it's not funny. One billion photos, all of which are tagged and identified and facially recognized and add to this incredible store of, of intelligence agency level intelligence about you. People post everything. I don't know how many of you remember this. Guy duct taped his kid for talking back to him. And he posted it on Facebook. Now, by the way, of course, he got locked up. He lost custody of his kid. But what the hell? I, I, have, I have pictures I can show you of people who robbed a bank in South Carolina and put up on their Facebook page holding the money, a gun, and a bottle of liquor. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to zip through a lot of this, but Facebook, both, and, and I know I'm going to forget to mention this because I have speaker Alzheimer's today, but, but let me tell you, even if you don't make a posting, both Facebook and Google save your drafts. If you're just typing, even if you don't save the draft, if you delete it, it's still there. I want to tell you that I've seen law enforcement subpoenas executed on Facebook and on Google. And what was returned and the sources of it, some of it I'm not going to tell you. But I'm going to tell you that it is such critical information and such remarkable information that major law enforcement agencies today 
task an agent to do nothing but be their Facebook agent and their Google agent. Sit in the Facebook and Google headquarters and handle all the requests for information and expedite the really, really important ones. I can tell you if you go and you pull up a, a thing on, on, uh, on Google to start writing an email and you change your mind, even if you don't save it as a draft, you start typing and you say, nah, I'm not going to say that. It's saved. And, and, and there's a lot of examples like that, a lot of examples. Facebook is going to be a telephone company. Facebook announced its phone. Facebook is going to be successful at it because they have more money than God and they understand that 85% of Facebook traffic today is on mobile devices. So they already know a lot about you. They get the information from your phone, but they want it to be their phone. And by the way, 87% uh, uses Android. And I mean, this is during, during Zuckerberg's uh, deposition, during the famous Winklevoss, Winklevi litigation. This is what Zuckerberg said about his original Facebook. I don't know why they give me all this stuff. They trust me, dumb fucks. Let's talk about Google. And we're going to zip through this like mad. Google has enough storage space to keep every web page in RAM, in RAM. Google has 600 PhDs. Google uses more power than the entire city of Salt Lake City. At two points during the past two years, they had more ready cash on hand than the U.S. government. That's no, no fooling, no fooling. Google is not just search. Google is everything, everything, groups. Gmail, Google Voice, uh, Android on 87% of the phones. If you use Chrome, if you use Google as an ISP, if you're in Kansas City, you have an unbelievable, wonderful, or, or Tulsa or any one of the places where Google Fiber has been put in, you have an unbelievable connection. You have super whiz-bang fast connection for almost nothing and Google views all your damn traffic. And this is what they want to do. They want to know everything that you do and everywhere you go and everything you look at and every interest you have. Not because they're big brother, because your eyeballs are worth money. They want to sell you stuff. And they're making billions and billions and billions of dollars. And they know on a regular basis your physical location and they never throw that away. NSA metadata pisses you off? Nothing compared to Google. And frankly, nothing compared to Facebook or Twitter either, which I'm going to demonstrate. Every time you use an app, you download an app, you express an interest, it adds to their store of knowledge about you. You check for apartments in Brooklyn. You go to Yelp and find a Chinese restaurant. You search for an abortion clinic. You search for an address at 2 o'clock, and at 3 o'clock at that address, there's an Occupy Wall Street demonstration. They know everything there is to know about you, or it's only one step away from extrapolating to that. Everything, everything, everything. By the way, is anybody in here wearing Google glasses? Are you? Okay, somebody punched this guy in the face for me. <laughs> I'm advocating violence, and I'm paying for violence. No, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You know what? In today's, in today's environment, I, I, you can't even make a joke. You can't even make a joke. I don't care if you, if you have Google Glass. Google Glass, shut down. Did it work? Okay. Never mind. Google now has peer-to-peer -peer monitoring of cell phones. If I don't know exactly where your cell phone is at, because the GPS A didn't kick in, it's only GPS, and I can only tell within a thousand feet, or a thousand yards rather, no problem. 
I know you're right next to Bob's cell phone, and I know where Bob's cell phone is at. This is a patent filed by Google using other cell phones to monitor other cell phones. I mean, it's a mesh setup, it's nothing unique, but it's being used for monitoring and data gathering now by Google. And tell the truth, is there a single person in this room who wouldn't be outraged, who wouldn't be throwing things if the NSA was doing this? But Google, yeah, we're cool with it. Hey, do no evil, right? We'll get to that. <laughs> Everything. For those of you who used Goog 411, you know, find me, Hotel Pennsylvania. I'm sorry, did you say Transylvania? <laughs> and finally, they made it perfect. And they did that for only one reason. Not because they love you. Not because they wanted to give you real, you know, free 411 and save you $1.95. It's because they wanted to use your input millions and millions and millions of times to perfect perfect, perfect speech to text so they could run conversations for the government and sell it. And that's exactly what they did. That's exactly what they did. I'm going to zip through this, but I'm going to tell you that Google uses every damn trick they can. They put out the best damn APIs. They want you to interact with their system because they get more information. They want you to design for them. They want you to use the Google URL shortener. Why? Because everybody who clicks on it, A, you've directed them to that, and B, they know what you're interested in because you've used that particular URL shortener. Google Glasses. Google patent filing would identify faces in YouTube. It's not news anymore. But if the NSA did this, you would freak. Google did it, you're cool with it. I don't get that. Google is a private industry. You have no control over their data. Once the information goes into Google, it is a private business record. In fact, the U.S. government can track you 24-7 using telco information because it's private business records. They can't put a GPS on your car. But Google started with satellites, GOI, about uh, five years ago. Google has now bought up a, uh, a company, and they are going to have 50 satellites in orbit by 2017. Google will have more satellites in orbit than the entire United Kingdom. Okay. Everybody uses Google. I tell people there are two Rambam's laws. Rambam's law number one, you are what you Google. Everybody Googles their name. Everybody Googles their address. Everybody Googles their phone number. 31% of people God knows why, Google their social security number. I have no idea why. Um, now I know you all are going to do it, and it'll go to 32%. People Google how to commit murders. People, two, a husband and wife arrested uh, um, about two weeks ago because their son died in a hot car. The dad is in trouble because he Googled leaving a child in a hot car. These people... This little girl is dead. A couple of people strangled her. These two knuckleheads Googled how to strangle somebody. Everybody Googles everything. Let's talk about do no evil because I want to make my point. Google does whatever the hell it wants. It does not care about you. It does not like you. It wants money. It is an avaricious, rapacious, machine of capitalism like has not existed since the coal and railroad companies of a hundred years ago. Now, by the way, as an avaricious, rapacious capitalist, good for them. But it still sucks what they're doing to people. Street view. They had to be sued to take people's faces out of street view. They actually fought it. Book scans and copyrights. You're a writer. You bleed for three years putting together a book. You copyright it. You put it out there. You're selling it. And Google, in violation of every copyright law in the world, just says, thank you, scans it and puts it up on Google Books. We're helping you. 
we're helping you. If people are looking for, uh, you know, uh, the phrase vampire at midnight, we'll send them to your book. The head of the publishing industry had a great quote. He says it's like somebody breaking into your home and saying it's okay because he cleans your kitchen. That's, that's not how it works. There's copyright. Misuse of trademarks. If I'm Pepsi Cola and I want to buy a trademark for Coca Cola, if I outbid Coca Cola, I get the ad word. Contempt. Absolute, I mean, the all mail folder, monitoring, I mean, street view, going onto private roads, going into private businesses, scanning every copyrighted book, grabbing every news. I mean, newspapers are dying. Newspapers are dying, and Google is one of the big reasons. You can go to Google News and read any article without buying the newspaper. Google Street View, by the way, let me, let me zoom in on that for you. There you go. Apparently, it's okay if they take a photo. Data harvesting. They sent out Google Street View cars, sucking up passwords, sucking up Wi-Fi locations. Why? They need those damn Wi-Fi locations to position your phone if the GPS doesn't kick in. That's their version of Skyhook. <laughs> Apple put a provision, a, a function in Safari where you could click do not track, where you could mess with cookies so you couldn't be tracked. Google said, I don't care, and they put a workaround into it. And two years later, they pay a $17 million fine. It's hilarious. They made $200 million getting this information from Apple users, and they paid a $17 million fine. Just to show of hands, I'm curious, because this was actually news to me until a year ago. How many people know what the old mail folder is? I love my hackers. About half the room. Uh, any other audience, it would be like one guy. You delete mail and Google. You think it's deleted, right? Nope. They just move it to the old mail folder where it sits there forever. For those of you who didn't know about the old mail folder, open up Google, look at everything you think you deleted in the old mail folder. It's obnoxious. It's really, really obnoxious. <coughs> Why does Google do this? Not because they really care about you or they want to invade your privacy or they want to be big brother. They want to sell you stuff. They want advertising revenue. And they suck you in with so many free services that after a while you have what's called in the investigative community, Google addiction. You're not going to leave Gmail. Imagine you have to come up with a whole, you have to give all your email correspondence your new address. Google Voice, you have to give everybody your new phone number. Everything in Google Docs and in Google Drive and everything. It's a pain in the ass. You're never going to leave Google. It's a pain in the butt. And Google is very, very open. We can suggest what you should do next, what you care about. Imagine. We know where you are. We know what you like. A near-term future in which you don't forget anything because the computer remembers. If I look at enough of your messaging and your location and use artificial intelligence, we can predict where you're going to go. Show us 14 photos of yourself and we can identify who you are. You think we don't have 14, you think you don't have 14 photos of yourself on the internet? This is Eric Schmidt, Google's CEO. They're upfront about it. Hey, we're screwing you, but we're doing it because we like you. Everybody does the same thing. Amazon knows everything about your likes, your dislikes, your finances, and your actual physical address. Have you ever noticed if you're reading something on a Kindle, you stop at page 148, you reopen it on your iPhone, and you're at page 148? Magic, right? Wonderful. It's because they watch you read. And everything that you highlight in every major ebook reader, you're sending that highlighting to the mothership. Amazon, Apple ebooks, they know what you're interested in. Banking. Everybody's horrified that the U.S. government knows everything about your finances, that there's something called FinCEN that, that gathers all your financial data together. Horrible. Let me tell you, 75% of the identity checking 
and financial data gathering that the U.S. government uses is gathered by Equifax Banking Services, a credit bureau. And they sell this information. When I'm hired by a client, hey, find me somebody's bank account, the first thing I do is I pull an Equifax banking report on them. I see what banks check to see if Bob is really Bob. Probably Bob has a bank account there. Sometimes I even get Bob's safe deposit box there. Rambam's law number two. All data will eventually be used for unintended purposes. You may think you're putting something out there that's innocuous and unimportant. Wrong. It can be repurposed, and we're going to talk about that. I'll give you a perfect example. I track down fugitives and missing kids all the time using Domino's and Papa John's. You call Domino's, I know where you are. You had a pizza delivered there. You think you're on the run with your cell phone? I can't ping it because you turned it off? No problem. Sooner or later, you're going to order a pizza if you're under the age of 21. <laughs> the holy grail, there's two holy grails for investigators and marketing companies. Your picture and where you are and what you do when you're there. And all of these things track Microsoft, Apple Store, even Windows Media Player, Everything, if you use we, if you use a browser, I mean, every time that you log in, every time that you authenticate, and even when you don't, even we reports where you are and what you're doing. TiVo, TV, everything. You drive a car, Easy Pass, Sun Pass, OnStar. Most of the stuff you guys know, but you don't know that this all gets aggregated into larger databases of information unique serial numbers in everything. We're going to talk about this. Every single damn thing that you do digitally generates or is from something that has a unique serial number. GPS is now good enough that I can not only tell what corner you're on, what intersection, but which of the four corners in that intersection you're standing on, especially if you're in New York. Cell phones, and I'm sorry if I'm zipping through this, but we started late and I want to end at 8 o'clock. I want to end the presentation at 8 o'clock and go to Q&A. And by the way, if anybody had any questions from the earlier uh, event, which I thank you all very much for attending, uh, you can ask questions on that too. Right now, right now, everybody is migrating to cell phones. Facebook, as Facebook tilts to mobile, 575 million people around the world use the, se the social network every goddamn day. Three quarters of a billion people report their location, their exact location within meters to Facebook every day. Google services, 87% of the people who use Google Guy's looking at his cell phone right now. I hope you're turning off location services. Amazon just introduced the cell phone the other day. This is the name of the game. And they're doing everything that they can do to hoover up your location every possible way. If you're in an urban area, they use Skyhook. They use Wi-Fi. They use P2P location. They use everything they possibly can to determine where you are 24-7. Why? Because they want to see what you're doing, what's of interest to you. If every Thursday you eat Chinese food for lunch, I guarantee you within a year you're going to be seeing things like you walk past your usual Chinese restaurant, you're about to go in, a coupon pops up on your screen. Hey, Julie, don't go into Big Wong's. One block down, there's Big Fung's. And here's a coupon for 50% off. Not because they really care that you eat Chinese, but they've got to deal with big fongs. And everybody who goes in and uses the coupon that they put on your, on, your, on your phone, on your smartphone, they get a piece of the action. That's why they want to know. I want to tell you, and Bernie S., who introduced me, actually worked on this case with me, um, and a couple other people in, in this community, there was a... a 13-year-old girl who had been abducted by a, by a, not abducted, lured by a pedophile to Philadelphia, and we caught him, and 
She was on the run and she ended up with another pedophile. We found her one o'clock yesterday. Um, how did we find her? We found, thank you. But here's how we found her. Old school and new school. We got, we knew she was on Meet Me. We, we did a connection to her on Meet Me and on Instagram. We show, saw when she was logging in. Law enforcement contacted me. Law enforcement has no idea what Meet Me is. Suffolk County Police Department. Great guys, but they're clueless with tech stuff. So we said, okay, here's their, their legal contact. Contact them, get us the IP addresses. We got back all kinds of crap. They couldn't trace the IP address. We went on a couple of public services that record every Wi-Fi address and where it is, every, every Wi-Fi IP address. We found their exact location in Media, Pennsylvania. It was uh, uh, the uh, public theater there. We sent a bunch of guys out with wanted posters. Traffic cop, a meter maid, found her the next day, grabbed her, there was a, she broke away, there was a big chase. We had her in custody one o'clock yesterday. And we did it by tracking her IP address. Navtech is an example of what's possible. They logged the GPS location of every business and every address. Every business and every address. If I know your GPS location, and I'm gonna show you with T Profit and some other people what I sneaky thing I did before the Hope Conference, they know is there a parking lot, is there a bar? It's good enough to the point where GPS trackers put on people who are on parole for DUI will alert the par parole officer if they go near a car rental agency or a bar. It's that good. It's that good. If you have a GPS in your car, you go find the nearest gas station, find the Chinese restaurant. That's how it's able to do it. They've got the GPS location of every single one. A cell phone will report to me your location, your location history, who you hang out with, where you go, do you go to a demonstration? Do you go to an abortion clinic? Do you go to a bookstore at 10 o'clock at night? Are you alone? Are you with somebody else? Are you getting on an airplane? Cell phones tell me every damn thing I need to know about you. As an investigator, if I have your cell phone stuff, I own you. You're owned. And I gotta tell you, you're pissed off because the US government has your location data. A, not such a big deal, I think everybody knew they had it anyway, and B, Google and Facebook have exponentially more connected to your cell phones. Here's tower location data. I know everywhere this guy is, everywhere, P2P -P pinging. It's not just your cell phone connection. It's not just when your cell phone is telling a tower, hey, here I am, here I am. You're also broadcasting your Wi-Fi and you're also broadcasting your Wi-Fi activity. There are now law enforcement and military and police programs that can target a geographic location. If I want, I can target the Hotel Pennsylvania and I can identify every cell phone in this room. I can identify 95% of the people attending a Steve Rombaum talk, no problem. I can identify 95% of the people that walk into a high crime location, a crack house. I can identify 95% of the people who attend a perfectly legal demonstration. This is social net, hold on. This is social networking activity. This is social networking activity. This is social networking activity, and by the way, once you have the people who are doing social networking on that location, you go to their social networking sites, their Twitter, their, their, you can see what they're logging in through. Is it Twitter? Is it Facebook? Is it Google Plus? What the hell is it? And you can see exactly what they're doing and exactly what they're posting. Silly things like this. There's an actual case where Al Qaeda got tweets with geodata and shot a mortar at the location because they knew that there were soldiers there that were bored and tweeting. That's an actual case. Don't believe me? Look it up. Here we go. And by the way, it's not just that. Just as a goof, we've developed a, a, a product for private investigators called GeoTwit. 
that allows you to find, to put a guy's name in there and track him through, G, uh, through Twitter and track him through Facebook. I can get your location activity and very often your pretty current location without leaving my desk by backdoor pinging your phone through this sort of thing. I just put in through Google's API, we just wrote a script, everybody who put in HopeX and, and generated their, their geographic location. Now, by the way, T Profit was kind enough to say, yeah, I don't care, put it up there. Um, I mean, this is where he was. We know that he was at either at the LAX terminal or driving on the 101 or whatever, talking about going to Hope. This is his exact GPS data, um, I think last week, from, from a tweet. Here's another guy. I understand uh, uh, his name's Silverberg. I'm sorry, Mr. Silverberg. I didn't ask you about this. I didn't know who the heck you are until Bernie told me today. This is Hope's vendor coordinator. Wonderful guy. Great human being. Please don't sue me for privacy invasion. And anyway, you can't. This is public information. <laughs> but 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 I, I ran him through the through the Twitter API. Not only did I get his exact location, I got his house. And Google was kind enough to pick, pull me up a picture of his house. So, Mr. Silverberg, be glad I'm not your stalker. Um, and turn off your location data. Please, please turn off your location data. You report your location all the damn time. If you're mad at the IRS, you should be insane about Twitter and Facebook and Google. Stop it. Stop it, stop it, stop it. And every single tweet is now public record. I can FOIA every tweet you ever made. That's really annoying, dude. Uh, <laughs> but you knew that. Um, come on, they, they've got a DVD. You buy the DVD, give some money to Hope. Okay, anyway. Um, sorry for the digression. Uh, I'm going to have to use my laser pointer on this guy. Um, yeah, the green one, exactly. Not even the red one. Every tweet ever made, back to tweet number one, is turned over to the Library of Congress. I think that's a wonderful thing. I think it's great, great, you know, citizenship that they're willing to do that. It tells enormous things about the world and how things evolved and what people cared about. A hundred years from now, people are going to be able to look at these tweets and learn remarkable things. Um, and, 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 and demented things too, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but remarkable things because honestly, social movements get tweeted, politics get tweeted, Everything that people care about and that are trending topics get tweeted. It's really obvious. But on the other hand, if I grab all these tweets, which I can assure you I've already filed a FOIA request to get every tweet in the hands of the Library of Congress, I will know everything that you do and everything you care about and everywhere you go. You've deleted your Twitter account. You haven't deleted it from the Library of Congress. You've gone off. You've turned off your location services. You know, you're no longer reporting your GPS. No problem. Before you did that, I got your house. No problem. Again, you can never make information disappear. Stop now while you can. Every damn Wi-Fi you connect from, unless you've really gone to the trouble of changing all your settings on every device, is saved. Now, here's an example, and I'm going to really zip through a lot of this. Um, how many people here have an app, either Android or, or, or iPhone, called Flashlight? Uh, not that many, thank goodness. About 50, I'm going to say, out of hun the hundreds or more people in this room. Uh, of, of those of you that have flashlight, how many of you read the terms of service? <laughs> two hands, two hands. One, two. Do you know that flashlight, which does nothing more than display a white screen so you can see where you're walking? I mean, it's, it, you, can, you can open an email, a blank email, and accomplish the same thing. It doesn't make your screen brighter. It, it just simulates a flashlight. You are transmitting your location. You are giving access to your camera. 
You're giving access to all your phone calls, and you're giving access to your UUID, your unique identifier, just for downloading this free flashlight app. Why does flashlight need your identity, your location, your camera, and all of these other intensely sensitive things? Because nothing is free. Yes, you've downloaded the free flashlight app, and they're making millions of dollars off of you by harvesting this information. 45% of all apps report your location. A third of them access either your camera or your microphone. Why? No good reason. They want to make money off you. If you're mad at the NSA, you ought to be insane over this stuff. Here is, I, I put up that thing, Rabbi, before that tracks you and reports on who you're hanging out with based on Wi-Fi. Here is the U.S. equivalent. It profiles you, it targets you, and it reports your behavior. And it combines your email, your web browsing history. It de-anonymizes your browser. It gets your tweets. It gets your social networking activity. Everything, and it puts it in one nice little package. There's now a federal word for this. Federal law enforcement now has something called data valence where they surveil you and they know everything about you and where you are and what you do and who you hang out with just from data. It can even report, Target has passed his phone onto someone else. Why do you think that is? Oh, gee, I'm going to leave my iPhone at home. I'm going to do like Snowden did. I'm going to put it in the microwave. Uh, I'm going to put on my tinfoil hat and I'm going to get a drop phone from 7-Eleven. Uh, Within one day, anybody who really gives a damn about tracking you knows that's your drop phone. Because your drop phone spends the night in Bob's house, and the drop phone calls Bob's girlfriend, and the drop phone goes to Bob's job, and the drop phone goes to the bookstore that always Bob, go Bob always goes to, and the drop phone is correlated with ALPR data in Bob's car. Devices have profiles. You have a profile. There is no such thing as anonymity. And it's a bitch to be a whistleblower, and we're going to get to that. Here is precise data everywhere you've gone and everything you've done. By the way, just for a test, they pulled in one billion records. Just a quick test, a billion records. The feds now have a term called community of interest, community of interest. It's a bunch of people they want to check out, uh, sort of like a hacker convention. No joke. Hacker Conference, Occupy Wall Street, bunch of people who don't like Obama. I mean, community of interest. This is their new term. And here is an example. And what is their program called for a community of interest? So help me God, the program being used by the feds now is called guilt by association. Uh, when, I said, when I said before they have no sense of humor, one guy has a sense of humor. And this is what it looks like. This is link analysis. This is who you're talking to on the phone, who you're emailing, who you're visiting, who your Wi-Fi is near. Guys, thank you. As an investigator, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm a lazy guy. I like to make money for doing as little as possible. Thank you. As a fellow member of the hacker community and as a good American who believes in privacy, and constitutional protections? Are you out of your frickin' minds? Really? Where you go, what you do, what you can be sold. They even have mobile location value chains now. I, I, I mean, this is, this is amazing. This is the main thing I want to point out, because we're going to go through this really fast. No device dependency. No device dependency. In English, what, they mean, what that means is no matter what you're using, no matter your communication tool, no matter whether you switch phones, switched MAC addresses, switched your MiFi, switched whatever, they can identify you. And trust me, it really, really, really works. Really, really works. Cell ID, accuracy within 100 meters, assisted GPS, A GPS, which by the way is now called GPS A, Within 15 meters at worst. Speed, slowest 30 seconds. I know where you are exactly 
at worst 30 seconds ago, at worst. This is an actual ping that I did. There was a girl that went, she was sent by her job in, in Dallas to buy pizza. She went, they wouldn't take her credit card. She went to the uh, ATM machine to take out money. She was on the photo taking, uh, they t the ATM took her photo and she disappeared. Nobody saw her after that. Gone, gone. Law enforcement wouldn't do anything because over the age of 18, you know, young women wander away from time to time, it's true, and cops are working on robberies and rapes and murders and whatnot. They're not gonna, you know, worry about somebody just because her office is freaked out. We pinged her cell phone. We found her dead in her car. She had taken some of the money that she took out, the, uh, took out of the ATM. She bought pizza. She bought a lot of beer. It was hot. It was in Dallas. It was 106 degrees. She's sitting in the car with the AC on, windows rolled up. She's drinking. She drinks enough that she passes out. Car runs out of fuel. Uh, AC dies. She cooks in the car. Uh, but this is, this is a ping. I was able to do this. If I can do this, well, I'm not the NSA, guys. Every single app that you download and you use tells me something about you. Barista, Cellfire, Compare Me, Loan Shark, you're looking for loans, you're looking for bars, you're looking for apartments, you're looking for jobs, whatever. Whatever you do tells me something about you. And it's buffered, and it's analyzed, and it's cross-referenced. Why? Because Apple makes billions of dollars putting things in front of your face and knowing things about you. And they have a division that does nothing but that, I add. You go, Siri, find me a porno house. They buffer that. Every single bit of data is saved and buffered. And your cell phone is a loyalty card and a payment device and a barcode reader and a store guide and an eBay or an Amazon portal, manufacturer syncing, retail object recognition, especially you, Mr. Google Glasses, backup of all data to the manufacturer. If you've got a Google phone, you can't, and, and an iPhone for that matter too, you can't, Never mind, you paid $600 for the damn phone and it's your address book. You want to sync, you got to sync through their program. If it's Google, you got to send it to the mothership and they send it back to your phone. Anyway. That is the size of the largest GPS now being used in phones. That is uh, it, it was much bigger. That has now been upgraded. Not that exact one, but ones like it. They're even looking at things like GPS darts. If somebody is a rioter, they shoot with, a, with, a, with an air rifle. They tag you like a moose so they can follow you from the riot. Right now, if a car, if a stolen car is evading the police and being chased, and it's not acceptable to continue the police chase, they just shoot the car with a dart, get stuck in the trunk, they follow it five blocks back, the guy thinks he's lost the cops, he ditches the car, they're on him like white on rice. It's unbelievable. Um, they're developing something now called GPS dust. GPS dust that they're gonna put on you, small enough that, you know, investigator walks past you, poof, until you change that shirt, I know everywhere you are. Two examples. One WikiLeaks stock, fascinating. You've got to read between the lines in WikiLeaks. The United States urged Afghanistan and Pakistan to enhance their cell towers and built new cell towers for them. Why? So they could track everybody. Shanghai, if you go to Shanghai, every single cell phone is tracked. And by the way, every single cell phone is registered, but that's, that's another story. I spoke about USA versus Jones. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. You can't put a GPS on a car. Everybody has their cell phone glued to their ass. It is their Star Trek communicator pinned to them. Okay, so 
you are a whistleblower. I have a good idea of who you are or who you probably are already. Because if it's sensitive data, there's a limited amount of people who have access to it. It's not like the stuff that was given away by uh, Manning, which was accessible by a million people through the military network. If you are a hot, a big deal, I was going to say something rude, if you are a big deal whistleblower and you've got really, really sensitive stuff, Snowden level stuff, there's a limited number of people who can get it. And by the way, since Snowden, it's even harder to be a whistleblower because there's really, really good audit trails which can't be erased and can't be circumvented on info. So they know the 20 people that looked at this piece of data that is now on the front page of the New York Times, or more likely Guardian or something like that, or Al Jazeera. Hello, Al Jazeera guy who I spoke to before. So you say, you know what? I'm going to put on rubber gloves. I noticed in the back in the, uh, in the Hope stock room, there were boxes and boxes of rubber gloves. I'm wondering why. And uh, that's, that's actually really true. So you say, you know what? I'm going to put on rubber gloves. I'm going to go get a box of envelopes that's never been opened so my DNA isn't on it. I'm not going to lick it. I'm going to get water. I'm going to take all these crazy steps, and I'm going to mail it. Well, first of all, when you print something out, every digital printer, every laser printer, micro embeds the printer's serial number in the page now. Every single one that I know of. Certainly Brother, Hewlett Packard, all the big ones. So first of all, they know what printer it came from. There's a guy I've been looking for all day. I'm doing a case with him right now. In Germany, we have a guy who sent out bogus invoices, and, uh, and we're going to lock him up in Ulm, Germany, because the printer that he sent the bogus invoices from has been seized by the German tax authorities. So we're going to be able to compare it and put his sneaky butt in jail and his two partners who are named Odie and Captain. Um, so first of all, you've got the micro-embedded printer. Second of all, how many people know that every single letter, show of hands, how many people know that every single letter that's mailed in the US is photographed? Holy moly, more than half the room. You know, you guys are great. You guys are really, really great. Um, honestly, if, if it was any other crowd, there would be a hand, and it would probably be like the postal inspector who's surveilling me. <laughs> um, every single letter. So unless you're going to hitchhike to Milwaukee to mail the letter, they know where it was mailed from, and that narrows down the circle of who it could be. Now, profiling people. There are pe oh, tinfoil hat area. The, I say that because this is the scariest stuff. This is the scariest stuff. Target marketing. Every book you buy, every music you listen to, every song you listen to, every place you go, every credit card charge, every OnStar, every Easy Pass, every swipe of your subway card, it's buffered. Now, let me tell you, not just the feds. Let's talk about New York City for a second. New York City is adding seven to 12,000 cameras a year, all networked, all with facial recognition, all part of what's called the domain awareness system. The NYPD has the most remarkable facial recognition system you've ever seen. They make thousands of arrests every year from cameras matched to photos. They sell that system to other police departments for $30 million. It's so good. You want that system, you've got to pay the NYPD $30 million. You use your Easy Pass when you go through the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel, when you go over the George Washington Bridge, and it's reporting your location? Yes, it does. But also through 284 locations in the five boroughs, where they have easy pass readers that log when your car goes past. Choke points, Lower Broadway, um, uh, 125th Street and Lenox Avenue, there's one. There's 12 halal carts, those, those, those Muslim food carts, that are really undercover 
food carts that are recording Wi-Fi, recording Easy Pass, and recording cell phone activity, and filming, by the way. And they move them near demonstrations and near sensitive zones. So if you're at Occupy Wall Street, don't eat the shawarma. That's all I'm saying. Um, ALPR, automatic license plate readers. There are 400 in the city of New York, 200 are stationary, 200 are mobile. Every parking lot, every street, there are the two forward-facing cameras on the back of police cars. They can film 60,000 license plates an hour. If I want to know where your car was parked two weeks ago, not a problem. It's in the system. And by the way, it's a private company that gets all these photos, even when the police take the photo. Everything there is to know about you, the marketing companies want to know. Are you straight? Are you gay? Are you Republican? Are you Democrat? Are you black? Are you white? Christian? Jewish? They want to know this. Now, frankly, kind of creeps me out. They want to sell you stuff based on this, but it kind of creeps me out. And I can tell you, depending on, depending on how intensely you've been if you are over the age of 21, they've been gathering data on you already for seven years. They start your first year in high school, where you go to school. Once you go to college, they start offering you things like credit card offers and book deals and travel and Cancun and things like that, and they get more and more and more information on you. By the time you're 21, by the time you're out of college, you're already intensely in their system, down to a granular level. And these are all the areas that they gather from and amalgamate. Direct mail, call center, in-store networks, websites, email, displays. I mean, everything, everything, everything you do is aggregated. And it's remarkable. There's a story that I, the type of data about you that can be extrapolated out is amazing. There's a famous story. Germans are really, really good with databases. Really, really good. So, my buddy from Germany right here. Um, there was a famous story when Volkswagen reintroduced the bug. I tell it every time I talk. They, the bug had been out of, out of uh, you know, the market for 15 years. And they didn't know who would buy it. And they couldn't find all the previous owners that loved it. And they did intensive, intensive uh, marketing surveys of all the people who bought it. And they found out two things. These people disproportionately owned cats, and they ate chunky peanut butter. So they got together everybody they could who had a cat and ate chunky peanut butter and marketed like hell to them. And four times the normal rate, these people went and bought the Volkswagens. You can extrapolate out. The political outfits do this all the time. Call Rove for the Republicans, Voters Vault for the Democrats. If you drink clear liquor, uh, white wine, vodka, stuff like that, you are more likely to vote Democrat. Bourbon, Fuddruckers, guns, you're a Republican. I mean, they, they, it's, it's astounding. It's astounding how accurate these, these, these marketing extrapolations are. And really, I can find out everything that I want to know. And they have ever, look, Facebook, LinkedIn, MySpace, Twitter. They grab all of that crap. They merge it with your purchasing activity. They merge it with your offline activity. How you can be angry about the NSA grabbing your phone metadata, which is really kind of bullshit, and not be angry about this is beyond me. Not be furious about this. Everything how much discretionary income you have, how much money you make, how much money your household makes, what you do for work, what your house is worth, your ethnic code, your religious code, everything, 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 everything. Do you have allergies? Do you have arthritis, cholesterol, diabetes? Are you disabled? Do you do homeopathic medicine? Do you like organic food? Are you a senior with senior needs? And so on and so on and so on. All of this gathered. Are you a new parent? Are you an expectant parent? You know how they know that? Because they buy this crap up from the doctor. How do you think you get a free coupon for Huggies one nanosecond after you give birth? That's how. And they segment it. Platinum oldies, 
well-heeled retirees, hard chargers, well-educated and professionally successful, kids with clout, tots and toys, they segment you down to the tiniest, tiniest level, like, like sand on the beach. And they, just, and they just keep going after you. Are you straight? Are you gay? Are you black? Are you white? Are you a Christian? Are you a lefty? What are you? And they keep marketing. <coughs> and they predict not only what you like, but what you're going to like as you age. They know a guy who likes X at 18 probably likes Y at 25 and Z at 35. They're waiting for you. They know what car you're going to drive. If you're driving a beater with a primer paint job today, they know in four years when you start making some serious dough, they need to market their asses off for a new car to you. And they really, really know stuff. Butter, white wine, Fig Newtons, fruit-filled cookies, Red Lobster, Volvo Yoga, you went for Hillary. Olive oil, bare-naked granola, lattes, blech. Cheesecake Factory, Panera, and Starbucks, Barack Obama. Uh, bourbon, stuffed crust pizza, Fiber One, Hardee's, Fuddruckers, BMW, and by the way, probably also disposable diapers, McCain. <laughs> Sorry, I had to say that. I actually like McCain. It's ridiculous. To the point, <laughs> people who believe in alien abductions are more likely to drink Pepsi-Cola. I swear. Okay, A, no heckling, and B, put your tinfoil hat back on. <laughs> Data mining credit card uses, it's astounding. Database milestones. I mean, I'm going to zip through this, but if we read every word of this, you would see they follow every damn thing you do. And here's a typical profile. This I won't skip because it's creepy. Guy's name, address, phone number, photos. He's in his mid-40s, he's Caucasian, he's married, he's a tradesman, sports and outdoor stuff, single family house, worth a million dollars. He's a male, he's a Pisces, he has children, some college, he's a homeowner, he's been there 17 years. What does it say for neighbor? I can't read that. Oh, below average neighbor, not at a million bucks. Um, he plays tennis, he plays football, he enjoys NASCAR, he loves to travel, he likes music, he likes R&B music. I, I mean, this is one schmuck. And they have that on everybody, on everybody, on everybody. And let me tell you, when I'm going to your house and I'm questioning you as a witness and I want to know who's opening the door, I do two things. I check to see do you have a gun permit and I pull your marketing profile. Because believe me, I bullshit like mad. Social, social engineering, baby. You'll be at the, so you'll, I'm, I'm sure you're all going to go to the social engineering panel later. If I know you're a Barack Obama guy, boy, I bitch about those Republicans in the South. If I know that you are a, you know, a stars and bars waving, you know, Led Zeppelin listening to Southern, you know, 25-year-old male, ah, damn, that Barack Obama is destroying America, isn't he? And it gets me in the door. It does it. This is the most important thing we're going to talk about, and check it out, exactly 8 o'clock. De-anonymizing data. This is the important stuff for whistleblowing and for your lives. Quick example. I use this all the time, but it's the best one out there. You are what you Google. You are what you search. You are what you have an interest in online. In 2006, the, uh, the Congress, I guess Lamar Smith, uh, discovered the Internet. Ooh, there's an Internet. And there's this thing called search engines. And they're gathering information on people. What does that really mean? We're going to have a congressional hearing. Your tax dollars at work. So they subpoenaed every search engine. Uh, Yahoo, Google, back then there was something called Hotbot, <laughs> uh, which is long gone. Uh, and AOL was one of the ones. And everybody responded differently. Yahoo said, bite me. Google turned it over. AOL took a middle path. And they said, we're going to give you all the search history, but we're going to anonymize all of, the, all of the people and their searches. 
and they turned that over to Congress. Once you turn something over to Congress, unless it's a secret hearing, it's public record. So the New York Times, God bless their pointy little heads, filed a, a FOIA request for all the AOL search data because they wanted to prove how easy it is to de-anonymize it. Sure enough, you have uh, somebody who was only, I love this pointer, you're not getting this back. Um, AOL searcher number 441-7749. Here's her searches. 60-year-old single men, landscapers in Lyburn, Georgia, Shadow Lake, Shadow Lake subdivision, Arnold, and dog that urinates on everything. So, not brilliant Sherlockian detective work. They went to the Shadow Lake subdivision in Lyburn, Georgia, found somebody named Arnold, who was in her 60s, and had a dog that urinated on everything. And it was her. Not real hard to figure out. That is the most basic level of de-anonymization. You all need to check out this panopticlick. Spooky. Your browser is unique. It is possible to do something called browser fingerprinting. <coughs> By the time you've added in the fonts that are unique to your system and the plugins and the, and the operating system and everything else that makes your browser and your system unique, and I'm not talking about the MAC address. I mean, the new um, Apple operating system, I understand is going to have revolving MAC addresses. God bless them. They're not doing that, by the way, because they love you and want to protect your privacy. They want to be the only guys that possess the information about what you're doing on your system. Same reason that Google now encrypts Gmail and search. It's not encrypted from them. It's encrypted from anybody else. But Panopticlick, your browser is unique, absolutely frickin' unique, even if you don't have cookies, even if you delete your browsing history and delete your cookies. There are entire think tanks, primarily selling to the government and to law enforcement, remote physical device fingerprinting. I look at your computer, up, oh, it's Bob's computer. Ridiculously easy to do ridiculously easy to do. Just like photos, you've just got to have the base set. Once you've identified enough computers, you can say Bob's computer, Julie's computer, Muhammad's computer, whatever you want to do. Because you've got the base set and you can match it. And there are companies that do nothing, by the way, today but device fingerprinting, and they have billions and billions of matches. Now that's in addition, of course, to cookies, browsing history, download history, embedded graphics, because you guys are you guys. I'm not going to explain what all of these are. Micro pages, passwords, personal data in search strings. I hate that. You do a search and the entire search, a phone number, a social security number, everything appears in the URL. Thank you very much. Things like form, which Google is now doing. Uh, ISP URL collection. You have Verizon, you use Verizon, you type in a bad URL, it knows exactly what you've done and it sends you alternatives because it's looking at and buffering every search you do, every URL you navigate to, and every, every ISP does that. Even DNS corrections, routers, man, thank you Snowden, probably the only other good thing you did but there are backdoors in routers, and routers are insecure. They really, really are. Flash cookies, respawning. Now here's the scariest thing, forensic linguistics. This gentleman, who used the name H.L. Mencken, or sorry, Henry L. Mencken, 1951, is in fact an assistant U.S. attorney by the name of Sal Perricone. Why do I have his picture up there? because he's actually an assistant U.S. attorney, a federal prosecutor, who gave a damn, really gave a damn, about one of his cases. And he cared about it so much that he started blogging about what a weenie the defendant was. And he didn't say anything that wasn't in court, but this was a really good blog. This was a ferocious blog. So the target of the blog, figured out it had to be this prosecutor from his courtroom demeanor. And he says, is this you? And Perricone says, bite me, I don't have to tell you anything. 
So he filed the lawsuit, and he subpoenaed Perricone. And <coughs> in the, in the uh, pleadings, he said, listen, Perricone uses words that nobody else uses, like dubity, dubity. That is the state of being dubious about something. I have significant dubity about this claim. No such word. But Sal Perricone used it, and Henry L. Mencken used it. This is a ridiculous example. So they subpoenaed Perricone, and Perricone admitted it, and he lost his job. He wasn't going to perjure himself. But I want to tell you that there are forensic linguistics programs now which are amazing. Do you put a comma before and, even though it's grammatically incorrect? Do you do last word, period, space parentheses? Do you use unique subject verb arrangements? Do you use dot, dot, dot a lot? Do you use dashes a lot? Do you use small paragraphs, like each unique discrete thought is a separate paragraph for emphasis? All of the unique writing styles that you have by the time you're 18 are a fingerprint. And the study of that is called forensic linguistics. And it's really, really good. And it's really, really fast. And they don't even have to have a base sample. They just take the anonymous posting or the anonymous email or the anonymous blog or the anonymous letter to WikiLeaks that they've intercepted and they compare it to everything else that you've ever done on the web. And they can pretty damn well figure out it's you. They really can. Uh, when, uh, when J.K. Rowling wrote her first anonymous book, they ran, they had a feeling it was her. I don't know how they had a feeling, but they ran forensic linguistics. Two forensic linguistics experts ran her book against her other books, found hundreds of forensic linguistic hits, confronted her. She said, okay, you got me. And these, these mysteries that she's doing now, these PI books, by the way, come on, PIs are much more interesting than these little wizards anyway, you know? <laughs> Anyway, so they identified her. Photos. Forget about facial recognition, which I'm going to show you. Facial recognition is really, really, really good. Every photo that you take, every photo you distribute has not just EXIF tags, embedded serial numbers in there, but, hold on, there's something called camera noise signatures. You can strip out the EXIF tags. I had the slides in the wrong order. I realized they're too late. You can strip out the EXIF, EXIF tags. You can strip out all the identifying digital information, but you can't strip out the unique fingerprint that your camera sensor has on the photo. I teach undercover school to a particular federal agency that puts people into high-risk situations overseas. And this is an example that I use. Not all FBI guys are bad, and in fact, some of them are, are wonderful human beings and great Americans. And this is one of them. It's a guy by the name of Jack Garcia. Jack Garcia was also known as Jack Falcone. Uh, he infiltrated the Gambino family. He busted up the Gambino family. He is the only federal agent in history where the mafia so bought his undercover, and he was so good at it, he's such a damn charming guy, uh, that they wanted to have him around, that they offered to make him a made man in the mafia. Unfortunately, he had to go out and shoot somebody. That was a requirement. Um, so they rolled in and arrested 23 Gambino guys before that actually happened. And I pointed out that if he tried to do that today, this is the, new, this is the Daily News article. That photo, by the way, he's a gigantic guy. He looks like a mob guy. I ran it through, I ran it through Google Image Search. I'm sure you all have used Google Image Search and TinEye and whatever to, for the poor man's facial recognition. Well, let me tell you, I put him in and it comes up right at the top, FBI agent. You cannot be anonymous anymore. You can't. 
And, I, and as you're going to see, even a tiny portion of your face, even a tiny portion. Now, by the way, this is the area a couple of blocks from here, Bryant Park, in 1998. Few cameras. 2003, few more cameras. 2008, it's almost a black square. Today, 3,800 cameras in that area. If you walk from here to Bryant Park and back, you are shot on camera, estimated, 115 times. One of those is going to get a good picture of you. You know that thing that you see in the movies where you go and you have the briefcase and the person you're meeting with has another briefcase and you put them down on the park bench and you pick up that one, he picks up the other one and you go your own way and you've delivered the data? You're screwed. I know who the reporter is. I know the reporter was sitting on the park bench. I got a picture of you meeting with the reporter. Facial recognition, I know who you are. Go to jail. Go directly to jail. Do not pass go. Barack Obama's inauguration. You know, uh, my friends have 24 megapixel Nikons that they think are amazing. One friend of mine has a Hasselblad that's like 50 megapixels, which is unbelievable. There are now cameras that are 1,400, almost 1,500 megapixels. They can take one picture of a Super Bowl game. One picture. Click, get everybody in the stadium. Good enough to recognize their face. Here is Barack Obama's inauguration, the first time this, this GigaPan was used. If you want to see something amazing, go to the GigaPan website, and they let you play with their photos and zoom in. Here is Barack Obama's inauguration. Closer, closer, closer. From that to that. No problem. And this is the old technology from 2008. The inauguration, by the way, the funniest thing, I took a picture of these two guys right here because they look like mob guys. They're congressmen. No, they really are. They, they, you know, they're wearing the hat and the sunglasses and they're looking very furtive. And a friend of mine in the Secret Service, when I was preparing this, this slide the first time, like six years ago, he looked at it and he says, what are you collecting pictures of congressmen for? Should I be worried? I said, I didn't know they were congressmen. I thought they were mob guys. That's the picture. And this is what you can zoom into. And the technology is exponentially better now. So first of all, you don't see a camera? No problem. Camera sees you. Here's an example in London. 67 cameras introduced. 96, from 67 to 96, only 500 cameras. By 2008, 4.2 million cameras. In New York, we're horrified. We get hit 100 times by cameras going for a walk. London, 300 plus times. Drones. I want to tell you as a private investigator, I use drones. If there's a big fence and a big sign, beware of dog, and there's a snarling dog, no problem. $300 Brookstone drone goes up 50 feet in the air, looks in, ah, no car parked in the driveway. I'm going to wait for the guy to come home. Everybody uses drones now, but especially law enforcement. There is something now called militarization of police forces. All the stuff from Afghanistan that they got to get rid of because we're pulling out, they're going to police forces. You need a Bearcat, you need 20 M16s, you need some drones, every police force is getting it. Uh, helicopter drones, Miami police. By the way, they lost one of them. <laughs> they have no idea where it is. Um, okay, Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. You take the thing, you throw it like that old wind-up toy when you're a kid, it stays aloft for three hours. This is a hybrid drone. This is a moth, a moth, an honest-to-God moth, that they have put a brain controller and a camera in. The moth flaps into your room, takes a picture of you, flaps out. Not a joke. Not a joke. <laughs> called Cyborg Fly. Here's something called the Devil Ray. The big problem is keeping the damn thing aloft. No problem. The Devil Ray has two wires that come out the back, it hovers on a power line, it sucks up the juice, recharges, and off it goes. Yeah. Okay, drone in a box, drone in a briefcase. You open the briefcase, and off it goes. Uh, butterfly on the wall, you see that? Developed in Israel, little thing, looks like a butterfly, it's a drone. 
with, by the way, a really, really good camera in it. Uh, that's, by the way, that's the close-up of it. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm not going to show you the video. This is a helicopter drone. Texas. I got a house in Texas. I love the cops in Texas. They don't just have drones. They have drones with grenade launchers. <laughs> Gotta love Texas. Gotta love Texas. Um, this is, this is a, a private photographer built a drone. That's a modified devil ray. Uh, private hobbyist. They even have drones used by sports photographers following the guy, hovering over football games. This is a, a drone with, with a really good camera in there, with a 20 megapixel camera. Here's another one. I, I don't have time to show you the video of this, but this will follow you into your house, perch on a windowsill, film everything, and tell people when it's safe, this is a military drone, tell people when it's safe to kick in the door. And by the way, this is coupled with standoff imaging radar that can actually see people walking around in a house through the wall. Okay, here's another one. This is Harvard RoboBee. This is a brand new one. That's a quarter. That's the drone. This is the new Parrot drone. Anybody who wants to can buy this for a grand. 20 megapixel camera, stays up for 12, 12 minutes and you can hot swap. Okay. So, you, you guys know about Reddit, right? Reddit and cats and all of that. A guy on Reddit, his cat that he really loved, died. He turned it into a drone. I, I don't, okay, could it be Photoshop? I'm sure it could be Photoshop. But it was on Reddit, so it must be true. Anyway, eh, cat drone. These are current drone operations in the United States. Current military drone operation. Actually, not current. It's like from two years ago. I'm sure the map is like one big drone now. Militarization of police forces. New York City has cameras everywhere. These are good Spico cameras. They transmit to the mothership. They go to one central location. They're matched with, with, uh, with facial recognition. Helicopters stand off two miles away. Facial recognition and ALPR. Oh. All right, my mistake. This is the Google satellite thing. They have this thing called Skybox, which of course I call Skynet. From 500 miles up, sub, yeah, sub one meter resolution. 500 miles up, if it drops down just a little bit, it can read your license plate. Google will have 50 of these. And what do they say? They say, well, it's to enhance Google Maps. Honest to God, that's what they said. This is the clean room where they're building the first satellite right now in Mountain View. If you guys think I'm making this up, hey, you're smart, smart, smart guys. Do independent research. Everything that's mated with the cameras. If you want to be a whistleblower and you want to get from point A to point B anonymously, you can't. You can't. You drive, gets your license plate. You walk, gets your face. Even if you look like the elephant man, you put a bag over your head, you have one eye sticking out, 5% is sufficient for facial recognition, and they also have something called gait recognition. Now, where they're identifying the way people walk. They can follow anybody. Once you're targeted, they can follow you down the street from camera to camera to camera to camera. And it can analyze what you do. Are you walking? Are you talking? Are you fighting? Are you meeting? What are you doing? What are you doing? 50 states now do facial recognition on every driver's license, every U.S. passport, every gun permit. Every time you submit your photo now to an official agency, it's scanned for facial recognition. Why do you think they tell you not to smile at the DMV? Not that you're likely to be smiling at the DMV, but why do they tell you not to do it? Because the best facial recognition, the best data points are if you're not adjusting your face. You don't walk down the street grinning unless you're a mental patient. So, so, so they want you not grinning so they can follow you walking down the street. 
People get arrested all the time from facial recognition, facial recognition. Now, real world examples. Brother Putin sent Russian troops into the Crimea. He's confronted for it. He goes, oh no, I would never do that. Okay, France goes, you know, a contraire, monsieur, pants on fire. We can prove it. And how did they do it? Facial recognition. By the way, this is, I stole this from the New York Times, so if you're from the New York Times, bite me. Um, they got Georgia 2008. Here he is with his special forces patches, looking like Sasquatch. And here he is in Crimea, same guy, facial recognition. Hmm, Russian special forces guy, Crimea. Maybe the Russians really are there. Here's another one, special forces recon unit. Special forces recon unit in Ukraine. Even with a face mask on, there's enough of the face. They have the type of mask. They have the uniform, the gloves, the ammo pouches, and the pants. And also, he's carrying a non-standard uh, weapon that they don't use in the Soviet, U Soviet Union, almost, Russia, with the silencer. They were able to identify this guy as Russian special forces, even with a mask on, even with a mask on. Uh, Israeli Mossad unit went to Dubai. Dubai. Hamas money guy buying missiles to launch uh, into Israel. They killed him. Good job, guys. How did they identify who these people were? From camera images in the hotel, camera images in the hotel matched to people who came in with passports into Dubai. Trust me when I tell you Dubai does not have a swift law enforcement system. If they can do it, imagine what American law enforcement can do. This is real, real, real world example. But forget about real world. I had a contract to find deadbeat dads in Illinois. I took the pictures, matched them from the deadbeat dad photo to MySpace and Facebook. And I found all the guys, where they were living, what they were doing, where they were working. Illinois collected a lot of dough. Texas sex offenders, people who weren't supposed to be online. Here's his sex offender picture, here's his Facebook picture. Now, by the way, this guy was the easiest of all. He used his pedophile booking photo <laughs> as his MySpace photo. A lazy, lazy, lazy child molester. This is, this is honest to God, not a joke, not a joke. Okay, the point is, you wear a disguise, no problem. Probability, 95%. Photo enhancement, it's blurry, that's an actual blurry photo, enhanced. So you wear a better disguise. Any of these areas are sufficient for identification now. You don't need the whole face. They even have something now, so help me God, I mean, it screws me, if you look at me, called nose prints. Nose prints. If your nose is sticking out, if you're wearing one of those Canadian, you're Canadian, you know the ski mask where the nose is sticking out so you can breathe, they know who you are. I mean, you rob a bank in Alberta, you're in trouble. Okay, you travel by car. Automatic license plate readers. It, the guy drives along, forward-facing cameras, sometimes one on the dashboard, 60,000 license plates an hour. Where you're parked, where you're driving, everything you're doing, where your car is. And they are owned, these databases, I use them all the time. I run people's license plates all the time in cases and find out where the car has been parked regularly. And if I find a place where it's parked two nights in a row, I'm parked there that night. This is a private system. It's used by automobile repo guys and private investigators and U.S. government and Customs and Border Patrol and the NYPD and the Marshal Service. And I could go on like this for hours. It's so good that now in the United Kingdom, if you haven't renewed your registration, and you don't have insurance on your car, in the system, it won't allow you to pump gas for your car. 
It turns gas off. It looks at your license plate. Ah, no car insurance, no gas. True. It's good enough that private industry can target you and microtransmit to the radio in your car. Hey, you hungry, Bob? There's a McDonald's next exit. Not making this stuff up. Now, before there was Google Glasses, Mr. Glass all over there, um, I predicted that this was going to happen, that people were going to have facial recognition with a little hard drive and they were going to be able to walk into parties and some woman, you have no idea who she is, walks up to you, hey, Fred, how are you? And it automatically pops up like Julia, husband Bob, three kids. You saw her last week at the Christmas party. Hey, Julia, good to see you. It hasn't been that long. Okay, well, Google Glasses 2012. Now you have DARPA glasses. DARPA glasses are ALPR for walking down the street. They're looking for people. They just walk down the street with this. And it looks at everybody's face, finds matching characteristics, puts up an alert, a red line under the head. No, I'm serious. It really does. A red line under the head. You look and you go, nah, that's not the guy. You look, nah, ah, that's the guy. DARPA's developing this. Here's the worst thing. Digital contact lenses. I am going to be able to walk down the street, this guy in a racial porno. No reason why I pointed at you. Okay. <laughs> in a racial porno, right-wing Republican, was at Occupy Wall Street last week, federal agent, hacker. I'll know all of that. Digital contact lenses. Listen, I'm making jokes, but this is in the future. It really, really is. Law enforcement is already using portable DNA readers, portable facial recognition from license plate uh, databases, um, portable fingerprint readers. All of these technologies are moving out into the field. Maximum, maximum. For the DARPA glasses in the U.S., maximum two years that people from tactical patrol forces that respond to riots and demonstrations will be wearing them and not just checking out are there any wanted people in the crowd that give them a reason to go in and snatch somebody, but they will be photographing everybody in the crowd and indexing the person. They will know from cell phone signals. By the way, in 2012, I talked about how everybody's um, cell data was grabbed at the Occupy Wall Street demonstrations from tower dumps. Everybody went, eh, not true. Three months later, it was reported in the Times. I'm telling you that this is what's going to be done. Everybody who attends a demonstration is going to be identified. Everybody. No anonymous demonstration. I mean, I guess you could all wear the anonymous masks. They'll still get you from your cell phone signal and the car that you parked nearby and your Wi-Fi and your tweets and everything. NYPD, in the past year, from facial recognition, arrests in 11 homicides, 124 robberies, 111 uh, larcenies, and 89 assaults, just from facial recognition. This is their, uh, this is the mothership. This is the NYPD mothership, which 20,000 private cameras, 300, it's actually 400 or more ALPRs, domain awareness system, 500 special cameras that they put out when things are happening, and 10 halal carts. It's actually 12, I think. The Matrix, yes, don't heckle. <laughs> Even if it's intelligent heckling. Facial recognition programs are being sold left and right by everybody. Now, we are amazingly on schedule. I've never been on schedule in the past 10 years. Um, new technologies, gate recognition. You can put a bag over your head, gate recognition. Honest to God, real thing, gate recognition. FBI is going to have the most remarkable biometrics database. And there's now something called biometrics from a distance. They can shoot your iris from a distance. Iris on the move, it's called. So they've got the biometrics, beep, they know who you are. Fingerprint analysis from a distance. Honest to God, it's a thing. 
I want to know if you're lying. I want to see if your pulse rate changes when I question you. There are cameras that see your pulse rate through the veins in your face and your head and tell me the probability if you're lying. I can look at you with glasses that change the wavelength on what I'm seeing and it will give me the probability of whether you're lying or telling the truth. And if I match that, by the way, with voice stress analysis, the accuracy goes up. Eye tracking lie detection. Now here's the spookiest thing. This was developed to catch pedophiles. You have a naked abused kid in a pedophilia photo. And these photos are traded all over the place. They wanted a way to be able to see who the kid was looking at. And they developed a technology that allows to be, to de-blur the, the iris and to see what face the person is looking at. This is a real thing now. This is legitimate. You can, you can Google, this is the, the scholarly paper, identifiable images of bystanders extracted from corneal reflections. This is a real thing. These are technologies that are coming along. Antibody tracing, better and faster than DNA from a distance. Interpretation of activity and behavior. This by itself should be an entire presentation. But here's examples. An Air Force civilian employee moves stock holdings from Boeing to Airbus. You check flights to Iran right before a bombing. You buy a book on fighting cancer. If you buy a book on fighting cancer, it's because you have cancer or somebody you care about has cancer. You rent a gay porno movie. You're probably gay, not a big extrapolation. You put an address into MapQuest. My favorite is during the course of a year, you're sitting next to the same woman on, the pl on a plane four times, and she's not your wife. Obvious, obvious. Fill a prescription. There are programs right now, NORA, ADVISE, other analytic programs that take all your data and connect links. There was a great, great thing that I saw some guy in, uh, in Yale put together a relationship thing that shows how if this stuff existed during the American Revolution, all of the leaders of the American Revolution would have been identified and arrested. And it was links to Paul Revere. It was brilliant. Really, really brilliant. Money, bioscans. I can right now, we have right now in our system, your physical location during the past 60 days extracted from online stuff. These are just two examples. Your possible associates your financial relationships. This is stuff that I do right now in-house. This is stuff that I do. Personality profile, firearms ownership. This is an example, this is an old example of relationship. This is the Enron uh, scandal. And they took all the emails and put up a relationship grid. And this is the person who had all the knowledge. And sure enough, the FBI figured that out after about, and the SEC, after about five years of investigation, this figured it out after 24 hours of analysis. These are things that are soon going to be a thing. MRI, investigative MRIs. I can put you into an MRI and determine very, very reliably if you're lying. Thermal imaging, automated face analysis. See through your clothes from, miles, from a mile away. This is a real thing now, being developed for the military. For those of you that actually, you know, read between the lines, let me tell you, HTML5 and, and, internet, and IP numbers version 6 are going to make you eminently more identifiable. Every device that you have, they're going to be able to give a unique IP address to. Every, every device, no more pulling it from a pool, no more recycling numbers. It's going to be a whole new thing. Super cookies. And finally, finally, and this is the last and most insidious thing, what 
General Petraeus called an Internet of Things. And an Internet of Things is a real thing. CIA, NSA, DEA, larger local police forces are all, all looking at data and profiling and activity extracted from devices in your car and in your home. I'm not going to go through all of this, but it is amazing, amazing. Smart homes, smart cars. Smart cars, by the way, are going to be running Android or iOS. Smart watches. These damn Android watches. You are strapping a tracking device to your wrist. If the NSA came to you and said, I want you to strap a tracking device to your wrist like you're a, you know, a condor or one of these, a moose or a bear or something, you'd, you, there would be a revolution. But you do it for Google? Really? You do it for Sergey Brin? I don't get it. Health monitoring. This is the new thing with Apple. Apple wants to know your workout schedule, the medications you take, everything. And there's even a sensor now that old people can swallow in, in, in old age homes, in, in care homes, that will tell from analysis of stomach contents for an entire month, did they remember to take their medicine? Also what they ate, and if they had a shot of bourbon when Nurse Ratchet wasn't looking. Look, everybody knows the target, the target hack. The target hack was done, I mean, I mean, I mean not just through the Chinese restaurant menu, but because they had a backdoor access to the network through the HVAC system. Huh? Correct. Correct. It was through the vendor. It was through the vendor. They got into the vendor and then they got further in. That's absolutely correct. It's not an important distinction, though. Okay. No, it's really not. I mean, they got in through a non-traditional method. Here is a, a milk jug that tells you if the milk is spoiled and if you need to buy more milk. Here is a networked oven. You're at work. You can preheat your oven from your iPhone while you're on the train, which also tells me you've preheated your oven. Nest Labs, which, by the way, I understand has now been bought by Google, it tells, is somebody in the room? And it adjusts the thermostat. And it reports on the activity remotely. And by the way, there was a, a flaw. You got to read between the lines if you're a good hacker. There was a flaw that if you waved your hand, you know, if the alarm went off, there was a feature that if you waved your hand, it would stop screeching if you were like smoking a big cigar and everything was fine. The problem was if kids were running around in the house, it deactivated. So they went into everybody's nest remotely and deactivated the feature reached right into your house, deactivated a feature in your thermostat. This is a thermostat that reports to Google if anybody's in the room of your house. Network trash cans. As an investigator, I do something called trash runs, garbology. If I really want to know about you, I steal your garbage. It's amazing. <coughs> the biggest problem is, even if you know the trash pickup, you got to go there with your waiters on and crappy clothes and the big kitchen gloves and every frickin' night. Okay, no more. There's now a sensor that tells if the trash can is full. I'll know you filled up the trash can. I'll go grab your trash. Okay. Ridiculous. You have to be the worst mother in the world to use this, but this is a Huggies diaper that tweets you when the baby is wet. Everything is being networked. Everything. Your baby's ass is now on Bluetooth. Your baby's ass is now on Bluetooth. It's not a joke. This is a real thing. Some Australian hacker was off on vacation with his wife. He left his teenage daughter in the house. He says, listen, I'm trusting you. This is the first time I've ever left you alone. No parties. No, Dad. I'd never have a party while you're three Australian states away and can't come home. 
So he had a remote power monitor, and he goes in, and he, ha and he sees the huge, the huge spike in the room where the, where the party would be taking place, and he calls his daughter, and he says, listen, get those bums